Welcome to Everyone's a Millionaire podcast, where we explore the world of wealth and finance and provide insights and inspiration to help you achieve your financial goals. Do you ever dream of becoming a millionaire but don't know where to start? Or perhaps you're already on your way to accumulating significant wealth but want to learn more about the strategies and habits of other successful millionaires. In this podcast, we'll bring you interviews with successful entrepreneurs, investors, and financial experts, as well as research-based insights and practical tips to help you build and grow your wealth. We'll cover topics such as how to invest in stocks, real estate, and other assets, how to manage debt and save for retirement, and how to build a mindset for financial success. Whether you're just starting out on your financial journey or you're a seasoned investor already looking for new insights and ideas, Everyone's a Millionaire is the podcast for you. So sit back, relax, and join us as we explore the fascinating world of wealth and finance. And guys and girls, I have an awesome guest today. I have a good friend of mine, Mr. Greg Helbig on today. Greg is a millionaire, so he, so he's a perfect guest to have on the show. And Greg is going to teach us about how he became a millionaire and what he's doing to build his wealth and all types of amazing stuff. Greg, welcome to the show. Do you mind giving us a quick bio? Yeah, thanks for having me on, David. I appreciate it. So I got started in this business. I was super young. I was 20, yeah, I was 20 years old back in 2015. So it actually was quite some time ago now. And, uh, you know, I was a college kid, a community college, didn't really, you know, know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to become wealthy and uh, stumbled upon real estate investing. They were talking about wholesaling houses at the time. They were saying you could double close and use other people's money and make checks for fifteen to thirty thousand dollars a piece. And I said, Do you know where you stumbled on it? Just by yeah. just out of curiosity. It was a it was a um Tarek Al Musa seminar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Flip or flop seminar. They came around and anyway, went to that seminar, signed up for their course for like two grand, and that's all the information I really needed to get started. And uh I spun my wheels for a while. And then after a couple of years, I started figuring out how to market and sell and communicate and deal structure. And uh, I'd probably say about 145 houses later, you know, between flipping, wholesaling, rentals, you know, we were able to to build up the net worth and then and hit the good old M word. Um, yeah, buddy. Cool. But obviously, it's been a journey since then. So you know, there's a lot of stuff in between that. But that's just kind of the cliff notes. Dude, you started at 20. How old are you now? 20. I'm almost 28. I'll be 28 in basically a week. Not even 30 years old, and you're on this episode with me. This is amazing. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So real estate for the most part, though. That's it's been know. all all real estate. Uh, I did a startup investment uh, last week. Well, not really a startup, but I invested in a company you know about. We could talk about offline. Sure. Uh, that's the only investment I've ever done besides real estate investing. Besides that, it's all properties. Amazing. All right, let's jump in. Five questions for you today here, Mr. Greg. Number one, what was your biggest financial mistake or setback and how did you recover from it? Or what'd you learn from it? Yeah, so I'll, that's a, I'll give you a good one. Um, I bought a building that was uh, probably not the best thing to do. This was in 2021. Actually, I was with you in Omaha, Nebraska when I signed the closing docs for that thing. Awesome. And it was an old commercial building, and it had three apartments and one store, and it was a very poor condition. Uh, I ended up getting involved in that deal. Uh, I probably lost only like $10,000 on it, but- the amount of just like stress, uncertainty, and just brain damage um, on that project, like really just opened my eyes to getting clear on on what investments to do and what investments to not do and maybe wholesale. So, I mean, on that property, I mean, we had uh, bad tenants. We had uh, cat feces in the attic that, that got a tenant sick. We had people uh, just complaining. And we had major repairs that weren't planned for. The house was literally like would shake. Like if you kind of wiggle back and forth like this, the building almost like no way, like a horror house. It was <laughs> terrible. We had to jack it up. Uh, so just the whole thing was a real just as they would say seminar. Uh, lost some money on it. Lost a lot of time on it. Uh, but you know the lesson I learned was that just because it's a good deal on paper doesn't mean it's a good deal in reality, right? A lot of people see these hood pro, and this wasn't even in the hood. This was in a respectable area. 
but they see these hood properties like in, in even St. Louis somewhere. And, and, you know, you get like a 20 cap on paper, but, but you don't collect any rent, right? So you got to really get clear on your criteria for investing. And you got to make sure that just because it looks good on paper does not necessarily mean that investment is going to pan out on a pro forma when you actually make the financial commitment. I mean, I love it. That's a, gr a great one. You know, it was... It wasn't a big loss, but it was the lessons. And that's typically some of the things. And that's why I asked that question out the gate. Yeah. You know, it's like, let's start with your loss or your mistake or your setback, because those are some of the best lessons. And you didn't even lose that much, but you learned a ton. So oh, that's awesome. I got a Harvard education and what not to do. Because I, I went into the deal and I remember like my attorney was like, dude, this is a home run. And I was like, because I bought it for 265 and it was worth like 460, 465, you know, and, and, and like, attorney's like dude you're stealing this building and i'm like oh that's awesome <laughs> but then like you know it's just the, the supply and demand there's so many things on that thing like tenants and and commercial real estate is a lot different than residential real estate and storefront didn't have good demand but you know that's when you learn your lessons you know did you uh, sell that building is it you don't want it yeah. anymore yeah i ended up so the plan was to burr it but once we realized there was no demand for the storefront at the number we needed to be at and the fact this is a huge mistake the property only had one boiler and there was three apartment units. And I bought this thing and it was like the middle of the winter when I was getting involved in it. So the you, the freaking heat bill, like the, the oil bill was like yep. $1,000 a month. And I'm like, Let's you know, on. I ended up selling it. Uh, and I, like I said, lost about $10,000 and it was all said and done. But, you know, it is what it is. I took some good depreciation off of it. Hey, that's a $10,000 lesson, man. Like you said, it's a Harvard degree right there. Harvard degree, what baby. not to do and what to do and what how to run better due diligence and you know all these yeah. things. So it was awesome. Cool. It was an old building. I don't like buying old buildings anymore. Unless yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Single families. You know, this was a multi shit show. I love it. All right, moving on. Number two, can you share, and I know you can, some specific strategies and tactics, tactics that you use or used to increase your income and to grow your net worth what do you get yeah. what would you say you know what would be some strategies and tactics to do such things so here's two things that'll punch you right in the face and get you rich all right the first thing is you need to really understand i call it capital allocation so every time income comes in from whatever business it is whether it's the coaching business or the real estate business i allocate the capital right so like income comes in from a real estate deal I have a percentage of that goes to taxes, a percentage of that big percentage of that goes to my savings account, which I use to invest. A percentage of that goes back into the business to fund the operation of the marketing. A percentage of that goes to my bills account for my personal bills. A percentage of that goes to my personal checking account. A percentage of that goes to my funding giving account. So I what I'm hearing is is that you are you're very diligent about oh, like a hawk. about planning, right? So you're like a whole, I have a whole spreadsheet when comes in, you're like, hey, I'm not just gonna do something dumb with it. I have a plan. I got a whole spreadsheet over the last like two years. Every dollar I've made in the real estate business is allocated in a bucket and you could see all the totals. So every single thing is divided up and I watch my money like a hawk. And like I said, a lot of that money goes into a savings account and I use that to invest in property. So number one is allocating your money like a ninja. Even You don't need to be making billions of dollars to do this. You could be making whatever you're making, but you got to allocate and manage your money. I learned it from a book called Profit First by Mike McCallowitz. Really? Yeah. And cash isn't king. Cash flow isn't king. Cash flow management is yes. king. That's Dude, it. It's, it's changed my life. And I actually messaged him. I had him on my podcast and I told him like how valuable that book was to me in my financial scenario. So that's step one. Step two is, is buying rental properties at a discount. If there's one thing that's moved the needle in my net, in my net worth to get to the M word, Mm -hmm. It's being able to do the burst strategy. And the reason is because you're, when you refinance, whether you do a rate and term or a cash out refinance, your equity, that equity that you have because you bought it at a discount just starts to stack on top of each other. So you do one burr, you got 80 grand in equity and you do one two months later, you have another 80 grand. And in my market, like that's normal. Usually it's- Yeah. Normal. And then two years goes by and they're both worth 90 they or go up. Yeah. They're stacking equity on almost on a bi-monthly basis with me and our market's expensive. So like, you know, if we have 150 K of equity, that's, that's normal. Like it's cause you know, the property's worth 475 and you know, we're in the thing for 70% LTV. So it's doing the burst strategy, which is basically buying the property at a discount, renovating it, renting it, refinancing it, and then redoing it. Uh, and then repeating the process. So, I mean, but, but so between saving the money to invest and doing the burst strategy, that is really what has gotten me to the the millionaire marker. 
And then I guess I'll add a quick bonus if you don't mind. And it's it's always being able to increase your income, right? Because the more you increase your income, your active income, the more you can play around with the burr and the more money you can save. So you always got to find a way. How do I increase my income? And if you have a job, the way that you could do that is become more valuable in your company. If you're an entrepreneur, how do you grow your bottom line? Not necessarily your revenue. If you're in sales, how do you make more sales? But you got to find a way to bring more cash in the door on the active side so you can invest more and then get your balance sheet built up by having all that equity in those burr properties. Dude, that was an amazing answer. Capital allocation, buying discounted properties, owning assets. Yeah. I love it, dude. That is, yeah. that is awesome. All right, number three. Did you have any mentors or role models who influenced your approach to wealth building? And if so, not necessarily who they are, Greg, but how did they help you? So I'm assuming you definitely had some role models, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of it comes from books. So like that Mike McCallowitz book helped me. Mm -hmm. uh, um, in terms of wealth building, I have a, a mentor who I, you know, I hired as a coach. Um, but basically his whole idea, and it makes a lot of sense now, is you know, if you can really do the birth strategy and systematize it, you will get extremely wealthy because you have all this equity you're building up and you could use that equity. That's how I build 90, yeah. 5 percent of maybe not five ninety five, but eighty percent of my yeah. wealth is from the the, the 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 birth strategy. So he really shared with me this thing called the burr on steroids that I'll share on the show. And and this is the whole gist of it. Instead of waiting to do a cash out refinance after six to twelve months, you borrow the purchase price, you borrow the rehab, you borrow the closing costs. And you borrow maybe like a five thousand dollar like profit, all up. Well, in some deals maybe fifty, bro. Over. Yeah, yeah. Depending depending on the numbers. Like I I've, call it a reverse burr. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so reverse burr. So you're getting a cash out refinance in the beginning versus the end, which yes. changes the rate and terms and all. And you your, do the rate yeah. and term, dude. That is that is exactly it's you do the reverse burr. That has been a game changer for me. The cash out sure. before you before you refi. You're just getting the money in advance. You and do you the rate and term a month later. later. So what? You're bringing less than you overborrowed. So you're winning. I, you do the rate and term. We do the rate and term like a month later. Yeah. And it's like, we got the investor. It's a pri you have to be private money to do that. The hard money, you can't do that because it's just, they're only going to give you a certain percentage. But you do the reverse burr. You get paid up front. You keep the equity locked in. And then there's no seasoning issues. You could just keep doing the rate and term reef because all the freaking permanent financing person sees is they just want to make sure that the payoff is the payoff. And the yeah. payoff is less than 75% LTV. They don't give a shit where the money came from. So, and I love it. So short answer is coaches, right? Coaches. Yeah, mentors. coaches. So you have them. The answer is yes. Yeah. And the way in which they influenced you was really just to show you, hey, you know, learn how to buy assets, learn how to use other people's money. Yes. Get into these assets so yes. you can essentially snowball your wealth. And that's what you and I are both doing is we're snowballing yeah. it by using, you know, these skills. So, wow, what a great answer. All and, right, and one more thing too, even, even yeah. the assets that I bought, like I have one rental I bought straight up cash money, Wheezy. And that property, like, <laughs> it, I got it so cheap. I was like, even though I'm paying cash for this thing and I'm gonna have all my money, not all, I'm gonna have money in the deal. Have the money. The yep. built-in equity is like, it's a no brainer. So like, that's where I make an exception to the rule. But this is a cheap condo in a, dicey neighborhood but anyway i, I got a cheap kind of dicey neighborhood too bro we're both in that in that game i love it all right number four how did you balance risk and reward when making investment decisions you know on the path to becoming a millionaire like what kind of things are you thinking about to balance that risk and reward i'm looking for the worst case scenario with with any time i invest in a this property love it. Uh, like for or or an investment club like a startup or whatever i don't do a ton of that but I'm looking at like, okay, if this deal takes an absolute dunk, right? Can I rent this property out? And can I at least break even or maybe lose a kind of minimum? Because it doesn't really matter uh, once you, you know, get- Dude, that's a great answer. And I 100% agree. I was talking to some students just, just last night and they were like, Dave, how do you know, you know, what a good offer is? And I say, well, a good offer, in my opinion, is one that I can screw up three different ways and still yeah. break even on it. To break even. And they're like, wait, so you're not necessarily trying to calculate how much money you can make. And I'm like, well, I do, of course, it's part of it, but really more so it's how much can I screw up and still make my money back and not lose? Because that's the risk reward balance. And if you can get a deal where you could screw up three different ways and break even, if you don't screw up, which ideally you don't want to, but if you don't, you can make up big profit. So that oh, reward 
I love it. So, man, we're on the same page. You got to go worst case scenario. Like, I, I'm really big with my flip numbers or rental numbers. Like, worst case scenario. Like, people say the ARV is 385. What if the ARV is 365? I pencil it at 365. Oh, the repairs are 70. What if the repairs are 80? Yeah, and be conservative on the ARVs. Be liberal on the repairs. Always. Exactly. Love exactly. That. And, like, you know, that's if you can do that and you can buy in areas that you really understand or your team understands, i.e. your agent. Mm -hmm. it's very difficult if you're buying at a discount and you're in an area where there is demand for product it's very tough to get spanked really bad man 100 all right here's the probably the most valuable question here looking back what advice would you give your younger self about managing money creating income and or building wealth all all three things essentially is kind of similar right but like what advice would would, what do you say? You're 28, man. You're so young. Would a 28 year old Greg give the 20 year old Greg when he was just getting started leaving that seminar? Like, what would, what would you say to yourself? I would say you can do it. I would say you could yep. do it. You could do a, you can do a lot more than you, that you might think you can right now. Uh, if I was like, going to just talk to my, you know, past self, I'd say you can absolutely do it. You have the ability to do it. You have, you know, the, uh, the talent and the, skills over time you'll develop um and i would tell him that the road is not easy uh, but it's certainly worth it and uh I would let me add a sixth yeah. question here because i think it'll help answer this one too what would you tell yourself to focus on because we could all do a hundred things that aren't important there's yeah. a difference between being efficient and being effective right so if you were to tell your younger self hey Stop trying to learn all this or do all this mm -hmm. or to read all these books or to take all these courses and all this nonsense, right? Instead, yeah. just do this. What is this? What is make it? offers? Ah, there it is, my. It would be make no, because ever I've never bought a house I didn't make an offer on, right? Mm. So it would. Yeah, be that. that's such a good point. I've never either. I've never bought a house that I didn't make an offer on. And after we get off this phone call, I'll probably make some more offers, right? So oh. if. I got distracted in the beginning and I was like, well, what do I do? What about this? What about proof of funds? What about my LLC? If I would just, if I got into the habit of making and tracking offers from the jump, you know, I'd probably have another 65, 80 deals done by this point. But, you know, you can't really do anything looking back. But I would say just concentrate on making offers to off market properties mostly, you know, on market once in a while. Um, but that's, you got to keep the main thing, the main thing. And if you want to build wealth through real estate investing, whether you're flipping houses or doing the BERT, you need to understand the one thing that will drive your success more than anything else is making offers on properties and tracking it. And that's really, it can be as simple as that. If you it doesn't have to be complicated, guys. You no. just got to know what to focus on. And, and there it is. Greg, I love it. You are the man. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, sharing your wisdom. This is the 5% teaching and making this podcast for the 95%, right? One in 17 folks at this point in the, in the United States have a net worth of a million or more. Everyone on the show is a millionaire. So again, I'm so happy to, to have you. And it's just awesome to be able to not only connect and, 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 and get together, but be able to provide value for the other 16 out of 17 people that are on the journey, you know, to get there. So again, thank you so much. And uh, you got any parting words for the audience here? I appreciate you letting me on here, man, because it's uh, it's an honor to come on and talk about stuff that I obviously am passionate about. And, uh, you know, if I had a show like this when I got started, uh, it would definitely would have been a little bit easier to, to make progress because, you know, I was always kind of searching. I'm, I've been a podcast audiobook guy forever. Yeah. Speaking of that, how can people learn more about you, your your podcast and things that you're doing? You know, yeah. Be uh, a good place to go. They could follow me online on Instagram, Grego underscore 37. Uh, and they want to check out, we have a podcast show. We do have had you on a bunch of times. It's yeah. called Real Estate Investing Fast Track. So it's like your fast track to being successful in real estate. Uh, so those are the two ways you can connect. You know, we put out a show every week. And uh, my goal, like you, is to, to help people, right? And provide value and, 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 and serve the community uh, and share what we know so people can also become successful. Guys, if you are in your late teens or early 20s, it's not too early to start. You can do this. Greg's a perfect example. Greg's one of my favorite people. I love this guy. And he's crushing it. He's doing so great. And, you know, he just knows where to focus. He's focusing his time and energy on making offers and doing what matters. He has mentors and coaches. I don't think I'm going to have any people on here. I'm just guessing here that aren't going to have coaches and mentors. Anybody that I know that's successful isn't afraid to ask for help. 
you know, and they want help because it speeds things up. So all in all, awesome, Greg. Thank you guys. That is a wrap for today's episode of Everyone's a Millionaire. And that's a wrap for today's episode of Everyone's a Millionaire. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion and that you've gained some valuable insights and ideas to help you build and grow your own wealth. We want to thank our guests for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today. And we also want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in and joining us on this journey of financial discovery. If you've enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our podcast. Leave us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to reach out to us on our website or on social media. Remember, at Everyone's a Millionaire, we believe that wealth is within reach for everyone. And we're here to help you achieve your financial goals. So until next time, keep hustling, keep learning, and keep building your wealth. Signing off.